Uh, the Vanderbilt Income Cancer Serum wants to thank each and every one of you for tuning in this evening. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started um, because we have such an awesome presentation for you today and we want everybody to be able to get the full aspect of it. Uh, and as I, you see here, we have Dr. Brian Reedy, and if I'm not pronouncing it correct, please correct me. Uh, he is the Chief of Clinical Trials at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, and he's a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University, where he leads kidney cancer clinical research efforts and the expansion of, can of cancer clinical research operation. His research intact activities include over 300 publications extensively covering, and this is hope I don't pronounce it wrong, gen urinary cancer, most notably cancer carinomas. Dr. Rini has been a lead investigator of several phases, three clinical trials, which led to FDA approval. He has spoken at numerous seminars and invited lectureships locally, nationally, and internationally on gen urinary cancer in their treatment. He is a member of ASCO, KCA, Kidney Cancer Association, and SITC, Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, with leadership positions of these organizations. He recently completed a term as a member and immediate past chair of the Oncolics Drug Advisory Committee. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Lenise. Um, it's good to be here. Just gonna get my slides up here. Yeah, so basically I've been at Vanderbilt since, uh, just since January of 2020. Um, I was at Cleveland Clinic for many years and, and came here, I guess a year plus ago to, to take this job and to sort of lead the clinical trials efforts. So my administrative position is basically running the trial operation. So every, any sort of cancer research that touches patients is, is I'm involved in. Um, and so it's obviously been an interesting year with COVID and that's a whole nother discussion, um, but it's, it's great to be here and I've really enjoyed sort of my time so far and the people. So my, so as mentioned, I'm a, a what we call a GU oncologist, genitourinary, which means basically kidney, bladder, prostate and testis cancer. And, and as you may realize, we all have specialties that are sort of groupings of diseases or for some of the larger diseases like lung and breast, you know, that's how they're grouped. And it's usually how the sort of surgeons organize themselves and then medical oncology develop later. So academically, for the last two plus decades, I've, I've really done kidney cancer. So I've been a part of a lot of drug development in kidney cancer. And I'm gonna sort of take you through the very basics of this disease and how it starts and the typical presentation and then talk about all the drugs we have. To give you some perspective, when I was a fellow, which was at University of Chicago in the late 90s, uh, there was exactly one drug FDA approved for kidney cancer. Uh, and now there's 15. So over the last 20 years, there's almost been one a year, which is an amazing pace. And I'll, again, just very sort of briefly highlight some of the progress that we've made. So I thought I'd just start with a case of sort of like typical kidney cancer. This is, this is what my clinic is, um, just to give you sort of a flavor of how patients walk in the door. So 62-year-old man comes in with some right flank pain, no blood in the urine, which is hematuria. He has some mild high blood pressure, not on any medication, high cholesterol, pretty typical for a 62-year-old man that walks in the door, has a smoking history, but no family history, a fairly normal exam. That ECOG zero is how we grade what we call performance status or how fit is a patient. Zero is hopefully all of us who don't have symptoms from disease. Uh, and then you see some of the laboratory values down there. Hemoglobin, um, sorry for all the abbreviations, um, platelet count, creatinine is kidney function. So just some of the normal things we check on patients. This is a CT scan, and this is classic kidney cancer. So to orient you, this is the backbone, this thing that looks sort of like a horseshoe crab. Your, your spine, your backbone protects your spine, which is right here. So the, the table that this patient's laying on is down at the bottom of the screen. We're sort of looking up towards their head, and they're sort of cut across their belly. <clears throat> um, you can sort of see that the part that I'm outlining now, if you can see my cursor, this top part is what a normal kidney should look like. This is the top of his other kidney. And you can see this large mass in the kidney. This is classic kidney cancer. Kidney cancer is one of the few diseases that can be diagnosed just how it looks on a scan. So uh, we usually will do a biopsy or take somebody's kidney out, but you can almost guarantee that this is kidney cancer just by appearance. It's very vascular. 
So when, when patients get a scan, they often get contrast injected in their vein. That contrast goes wherever the blood goes. So organs and tumors that have a lot of blood flow will be bright. So kidneys are bright. This is the patient's aorta. It's obviously a big blood vessel, which is bright, et cetera. So it's very bright because it's very vascular, and I'll tell you why that's important. And then you get some dead cells uh, sort of in the, in the center of the tumor. And then unfortunately, this patient had disease that was advanced. And so you can see the circle. This is the patient's lung, sorry. So here's the backbone again, same orientation, but we're up higher in the body. This big glob is the heart in the middle here. The two um, black things are the lungs. There's a lot of lines and squiggles. Those are all normal blood vessels, but you could see this sort of lump right here and right here as well. And this is, again, very typical kidney cancer. 60-some-year-old man walks in the door, maybe has some symptoms very briefly and, and you know, sort of presents with this advanced disease, unfortunately. And then we would usually do a biopsy of something, in this case, a lung nodule. And I don't know how much of this you get in the talks, but, you know, these are cancer cells under a microscope. So like, you know, each, each one of these dark circles is the center, the nucleus of a cancer cell. And obviously there's a bunch of them globbed together. And we call, the, the other name for kidney cancer is clear cell uh, carcinoma. And it's called clear cell because you can see these cells look clear under a microscope, sort of almost medical trivia for you there. So this would be a very typical patient that I see in clinic. So let's go backwards a little bit and we can talk about, um, you know, the big picture of kidney cancer. So you can see these estimates, these numbers are probably a little old, um, but there's about, you know, 65, 75,000 new cases of a year of kidney cancer in the United States. There's about 170,000 worldwide. And you can see, unfortunately, there's uh, almost 14,000 deaths and that number's probably held steady. Um, and these numbers have probably gone up over time in part because we're doing more scans on people when they come into the emergency room, we're diagnosing it more and earlier. Um, so the incidence has probably gone off. But just to give you a rough number, compare this to say breast, prostate, lung cancer, which have about 250 to 300,000 patients a year. So it's about a, a quarter as common as those cancers. It's mostly in men, about two to three to one male to female ratio, median age in the early 60s. And then in terms of what causes kidney cancer, most patients don't have an identifiable cause. Smoking is a risk factor, but it's a relatively weak risk factor. So relative risk is what risk of developing this cancer do smokers have compared to non-smokers? And you can see it's about a twofold risk. In lung cancer, it's about tenfold. So it is a risk factor, but not as strong as in lung cancer. And then other things, having high blood pressure, obesity, um, cystic disease in the kidneys or being on uh, dialysis if kidneys have failed, and then some other like um, chemical exposures. But the vast majority of patients do not have anything identifiable. In terms of stage of diagnosis, so when we think about solid tumors, so lung, breast, prostate cancer, things like that, we think about stage. And you can really break it down into three buckets. It's either localized, it's in the organ that it started. It's what we call regional. So it's kind of outside that organ, maybe to nearby lymph nodes, or it's metastatic, it's spread. And you can see the breakdown. Fortunately, most patients with kidney cancer walk in the door with just a kidney mass. It's localized disease. Others have more advanced disease. But anybody in this 78% localized or what we'd call regional, they go to surgery. I'm not really going to talk about surgery, but, but you know, the treatment for those patients is basically just to cut their kidney out, part or all of their kidney. Um, and that's been the treatment for, for many decades. As a med I'm a medical oncologist, so where I get involved, of course, is patients, unfortunately, who have advanced disease, this sort of 20% of patients. So in terms of, of symptoms, you know, how do people present? <clears throat> so, you know, back when I was in medical school 25 years ago, you learned about the classic triad for kidney cancer, which was flank pain, blood in the urine, and a, and a palpable mass on exam. That's pretty darn uncommon these days. Almost, I, I can't think of the last patient I had who presented with all these symptoms, simply because patients are diagnosed much earlier because of such frequent CT scanning. Um, Many patients will have blood in the urine. So a common presentation would be, you know, the patient like I presented says, yeah, I, you know, I've never done it before, but I went to the bathroom and I, I urinated blood one time and then it went away, you know, and it never happened again. And, and unfortunately, some of those patients don't seek medical attention. It's never normal to urinate blood. Um, so that's probably the most common of these, but still not, I, I wouldn't say that common. Everything else here is just other things that are more rare. Patients can present with high blood pressure, high calcium, erythrocytosis is a high red blood cell count, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
but that just, again, gives you a flavor of, of how patients present. So this is a slide that looks at the difference between what we call sporadic kidney cancer and inherited. So sporadic means um, you didn't inherit it from your parents. It's just something that happened. For whatever reason, the cells in your kidney turned, into, turned cancerous. Those patients usually present with one tumor, you know, solitary, one tumor on one side. Um, it, it goes up with age, as I mentioned, getting diagnosed earlier and earlier, contrasted with the small percentage of patients who have an inherited syndrome. And I'm not going to go into the different syndromes, but we see this, you know, again, not very common, less than 5% of the time. But these would be young patients who present with a lot of tumors in their kidney. We have a special interest at Vanderbilt in what's called von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, which is the most common syndrome that produces this. We have a whole cadre of patients who are 20s and 30s who have multiple tumors in their kidney. And again, I'm not going to go too much into it, but these patients really, they, they get sequential surgery. So they'll get this tumor taken out, then this one taken out, and then two years later, this one taken out. So it's sort of a staged surgical approach. Um, but there are some new medicines for these folks we could you know, talk about at the end or at a different time. But again, very different. Again, the vast majority of people will have sporadic kidney cancer. Same with any other solid tumor, by the way. This is the staging. I guess this is um, looking at sort of staging in the kidney. I probably could have put this next to my other slide on staging. Every cancer is staged, right? And stage is just spread. Um, it's generally one to four. One is smaller, confined to the kidney. And as you go down by stage, tumors get bigger. They involve, say, lymph nodes, or stage four is really uh, spread to distant organs like lung and lymph node commonly. And quite obviously, the chance of cure goes down the higher the stage. That's true pretty much for any malignancy. So I'm going to talk about basically that when I'm meeting with patients, so when I see a new patient who has kidney cancer that's spread, which I do multiple times a week, what I say is, listen, there's two ways we treat kidney cancer. The first way is shown on this slide. It's cutting off the blood supply to a tumor. And the second way is with immune stimulating drugs. We don't give chemotherapy to kidney cancer patients. We don't do radiation generally. So it's not the typical type of anti-cancer therapy. Um, but the, the, the way the drugs work is, again, choking out the blood supply of the tumor. And that's shown here. Because of the genetics of kidney cancer, it, it overproduces this protein that's called VEGF. And basically, this is a protein that stimulates blood vessels. You can see all the different ways it stimulates blood vessels. And so in kidney cancer, that's just inherent to the biology of the disease. It's a very bloody disease. It's a very vascular disease. And that's why it's very bright on the scans. If you remember that picture of the kidney I showed you, it was very bright because of this biology here. It takes up, uh, it, it has a very rich blood supply. So it takes up the contrast and appears bright on a scan. And it's because of this, this biology. And then... We now have a whole litany of drugs that sort of block this. Mostly we use these drugs down here. I, I've given you the brand names. Uh, and they sort of block below the surface of a blood vessel. So this is kind of similar if you've had lectures on, say, lung cancer or, gosh, I don't know, other cancers that have what we call targeted therapy. So targeted therapy means different things in different cancers. In kidney cancer, it means targeted to blood vessels. So a whole litany of drugs. I probably don't even have a complete list here. There's six or eight of them that inhibit this certain receptor and sort of inhibit all this blood vessel formation. And they're a very effective way to control disease, but they're not curative. And these are just some facts about, so, so just to put it in perspective, um, I mentioned there was one drug FDA approved when I was a fellow. I'll tell you about that in a second. When I was early in my faculty career, I was out at UCSF. And then when I transitioned to Cleveland, all these drugs were being developed in kidney cancer. So we finally had some drugs that worked. We finally could at least control disease and shrink tumors. But these drugs all got approved in the, I would say, mid-2000s for the next eight or 10 years was sort of these drugs. Um, the good news is that most patients have their tumors get smaller. About a third of patients have tumors get significantly smaller. As you may know, we call a quote-unquote response when tumors in some get 30% smaller. Um, we can, can, what I tell patients if I was starting them on this therapy, which I don't anymore by itself, but if I were, we can control disease for about one year. Um, but the range is very large. So I'm about to show you a slide that tells you that kidney cancer is a very biologically diverse disease. Some patients have exceedingly slow growing tumors and some patients, unfortunately, have very fast growing tumors. And just like that, 
natural history would say, what, what naturally the natural tumor growth rate, the response to this kind of therapy is, is very um, varied as well. Some people don't respond at all, and I've had patients on these types of treatments for 10 years. It does require generally ongoing therapy, and anytime you're constantly giving therapy, you're constantly exposing patients to potential side effects. And so that's a, a challenge that we've dealt with over the last, gosh, 15 years now. So the other way we treat kidney cancer is, is, as I'm sure you've heard in other lectures, is immunotherapy. What's unique about kidney cancer is that immunotherapy was actually the first drug approved for kidney cancer. It was back in 1992. I think it's my next slide. This is a slide that's not about a particular drug. It's just about to show you that in the old days, and, and what I'm showing you here is um, the proportion of patients that are surviving with a given treatment over time. And what it's really meant to show is it's, it's about old immune therapy. And unfortunately, with our old therapy, not the ones we use now, but our old therapy a couple of decades ago, most patients didn't benefit. So unfortunately, when these curves go down like this, it means patients are not benefiting from therapy. But there was always sort of a subset of patients who did well. So this, what we call a tail of the curve, 10 or so percent of patients who are alive five, six, seven years later. Um, and in the era when these drugs this slide was made, the average survival was one year. So to have patients survive four, five, six, seven years is really quite remarkable. But unfortunately, it was only a, a fraction of patients. But it, kidney cancer always had the, the reputation of being very responsive to immune therapy. And this finally is the drug I was talking about that was the first one approved in 1992. It's called high dose IL-2 is um, short for interleukin-2. It's a protein we all have in our bodies normally when we get the flu, it gets revved up. You can give it in super high doses. It makes people terribly ill, but it can cure some patients with kidney cancer. And so um, this, uh, this graph doesn't make much sense, but about 5% of patients are cured with this drug. It, it wasn't used, it's barely used now, and it wasn't used much even back when it was the only thing approved because it's exceedingly toxic. Patients have to go into the intensive care unit. It's awful therapy. So it was around, it was available, but it was a pretty rare patient who would even be healthy enough to get it. And this is sort of the new immunotherapy. And so um, apologize for the complex graphic, but when I'm describing it to patients, the, therapy, the immune therapy we have presently, which are called checkpoint inhibitors, are basically removing the breaks in the immune system. So if you look sort of on the left here, when we're talking about immune therapy, what we're really talking about is stimulating T cells to kill tumor cells. So that's what immune therapy is, getting these T cells revved up to kill cancer cells. And there's all sorts of different mechanisms and ways that T cells interact with other cells. And these positive and negative here are basically um, signals that stimulate the T cell and the negative are um, signals that downregulate that response, that dampen that response. And if you think about this, this is just normal physiology. In normal human beings, every physiologic process has things that promote it and things that keep it in check, right? It's just, the way, it's just the way we were made. Every process, everything in your body does that. There's things that stimulate your heart rate and then there's mechanisms to reduce your heart rate, stimulate you to breathe faster and then stimulate you to breathe slower. It's just the way our body regulates itself and your immune system's no different. So we want a revved up immune system, but we don't want it too revved up because that's called autoimmune disease like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Those patients' immune systems are too revved up against different body parts. So anyway, same concept in cancer. We're trying to rev up the immune system. And one way to do that is to remove the breaks, to remove these negative signals. And that's all of checkpoint inhibition, all of immune therapy in cancer is basically doing that to, to sort of simplify it. Okay, I'm kind of jumping around, but this is a very old slide. And what it's really meant to show is that what I, what I stated before is kidney cancer is a very you know, one of the reasons I was drawn to it, if you will, it's a very interesting disease. It's very biologically diverse. And this was a group of a very large group of patients that this was a, a separate project. But what it shows you are sort of the, the survival curves for different groups of patients. And as I mentioned, curves that go down are no good because that means patients are dying quickly. And so these are patients who have very fast disease. But if you look over way on the other side, you can see this white line here. Those patients have an average survival measured in many years. And this is back before we had a lot of our currently, you know, current therapy that's very active. But it just shows you a very wide range in disease, I think wider than any other solid tumor that I'm aware of. 
And one of the reasons that this is important is some work that I did when I was back in Cleveland is actually observing patients with metastatic kidney cancer. So the assumption is that if somebody has a cancer that's spread, that they immediately need treatment. And that's generally true for 80 or 90% of patients. But we did this study where we took patients who had very slow growing kidney cancer. That's kind of what all this says. Walked in the door with what we thought was slow growing disease. And we just observed them. We didn't treat them. And we left it up to the doc and the patient about when they wanted to treat them. And we just did CT scans to measure their disease. And what we saw, and I would just sort of focus on these numbers is that we could actually, this is probably the most important number, this 14.9. We could observe patients for well over a year, almost 15 months before they needed treatment. Um, and it's, this had kind of been done in kidney cancer, but nobody had really studied it prospectively, meaning sort of starting at the beginning of the observation period. And so it's turned out to be, I think, important data for the field because I think patients, excuse me, I think doctors and patients realize now that gee, maybe I don't need treatment right away for my kidney cancer. And it's one of the first questions in my mind as I'm seeing a patient is, is there a role to observe this patient at first, knowing full well that they're eventually going to need treatment. And then <clears throat> just to sort of put together, and I'm not going to go into a lot of specifics about the regimens or drug names. I don't think it's terribly important, but here's how we treat kidney cancer that walks in the door. We basically, everybody gets one immune therapy drug, and it's either paired with another immune therapy drug or with one of those blood vessel targeting drugs. And the, it's, it's a little bit complex of why you choose two immune drugs or an immune drug and a blood vessel drug, et cetera. At the end of the day, I don't know that that detail matters here, but there are um, five regimens that are approved combinations. So in our field, we would say an immune-based combination, immune-based doublet. That patient that I talked about that walked in the door that case I gave at the beginning, that patient would get an immune-based doublet. That would be standard of care for that patient. Um, probably about 20% of patients are cured with that approach. So that's a much higher number than we've ever had in the past. Remember I said it was about 5% with that old immune therapy drug. So it's we don't really know this yet because it takes a long time to declare patients cure, but it's probably a good 15, 20, maybe up to even 30% of patients. I think I have one slide after this to show that. Um, but cure is certainly possible. If patients aren't cured, well, then they go on to other therapy. And that other therapy, frankly, is usually more of these blood vessel targeted drugs. But this is, you know, we do a lot of clinical trials of combinations and in the setting of if patients have not responded to initial combinations. But just sort of as a graphic, this is how we treat the disease. All right, super complicated slide. I'm sorry. This is just, you know, again, it's data from a manuscript. But if you focus up here just on this A, the one that's labeled A, so you see here progression-free survival. Progression-free survival is a term that says, how long are patients um, on therapy without their disease getting worse, right? They're free from progression of disease. They're alive and their disease is not progressed, right? That's where we want all patients to be. And this is, a, this is from one of, the, one of those combinations that I mentioned. You could see a full third of patients as you get out to three and a half years are still alive and their disease is not progressed. That's pretty remarkable. And it's possible that these patients are cured of disease. I don't think it'll be all these patients, but I think it'll be most of them. And that's why I quoted you probably 20 or 30% of patients can be cured with these regimens. Um, again, a lot of complex curves here, but that's really sort of the take home point. And this is my last sort of graphic. And it's, it's, you see these in a lot of talks. It's one of these classic timeline slides. And basically it says, gee, back in 1992, there was one drug and it basically takes you through all the approvals. Again, mid 2000s, all those anti-blood vessel drugs, the newer immunotherapies I talked about, the combinations I talked about. So it takes you through the timeline of drugs. Again, the names and the dates aren't important. What's important is down here. How long do patients with this disease live? Well, again, when I was a fellow, it was one year, right? That was back when we had one drug and not a lot else. When we first started developing these drugs in the 2000s, it went to two years and then it went to three years. And now with these combinations, it's, it's probably in the four to five year range. And, and nobody would argue that that's long enough, but some of these patients are cured and it's, it's a whole lot longer than it was, you know, again, 20 years ago. So I'm hopeful by the time, you know, in another 20 years, um, you know, this number will be much higher and we'll be curing most patients. And I think we're headed there slowly, but this is really just to show sort of a big picture of, of the progress that, that has been made over the, the last couple of decades that I've been involved. So just to wrap up, kidney cancer is a very 
unique biology. Again, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting disease from a, from a doc standpoint, from an academic standpoint. It can be very slow growing, can be much faster growing. I have a woman who actually followed me from Cleveland, who I think has had advanced kidney cancer for like 12 years, 14 years without any treatment. So just very oh. slow growing disease. Again, that's a, that's a unique anecdote. Um, I think she followed me because she thought I had something to do with her slow growing disease, which of course I didn't. But um, the way we treat this disease is either drugs that inhibit blood vessels or drugs that stimulate the immune system, or as I told you, both really, right, in combination. But obviously we got a lot of work to do, right? Until we're curing every patient that walks in the door, we need better drugs, better combinations. That's why we're here at Vanderbilt. That's why we do trials. Um, but cure is possible. And this is, it's nice to talk to patients on that first visit that, you know, although I obviously can't guarantee results, I know that patients that I see that are sitting there are going to be cured of disease. Yeah, it's hard for me to quote them a number. I, I usually sort of hedge in that 20 to 30% range, but it, it's certainly a number greater than zero. And it's, it's not it's not 1% or something. I think it's a significant fraction of patients. And obviously we're trying to do, trying to do better. So I will stop there. Let me just go ahead and let's look at them for you. Um, can you do, before we get into the other questions, can you talk about COVID and cancer and what have you seen in the last 14 months? That's a big topic. <laughs> uh, COVID, yeah. Um, so as you may know at Vanderbilt, we have this COVID and cancer consortium. It's a big, it's now about 10,000 patients with a diagnosis of cancer, either active or in the past who had a COVID infection. So we have this big database of patients. So I'm mostly quoting from that. Um, we know cancer patients have a higher, a higher complication rate with COVID. They're more often in the hospital. They're more often sick in the intensive care unit. They more often die from COVID. Probably our, our last data was about, I think, 12 or 13% of cancer patients who get COVID will have a serious complication, including death. So it's more serious in a cancer population than in a, in a non-cancer population. That's not too surprising, right? Because cancer patients are older. They obviously have cancer to deal with. They might be on therapy. So there's a lot of reasons for that. That's probably the biggest take home. I don't know if we know if cancer patients are more susceptible to COVID. Um, we haven't really done that. I think people assume so, and I think it's probably true, but I'm not sure that I know of data that would suggest that that's the case. Um, but of course, if they're on chemotherapy or other drugs that impair their immune system, it's certainly believable. Um, we know a lot of patients had delays in their care because of COVID. And if you remember a year ago, we were still not doing surgeries and, you know, we were putting off a whole lot of things, cancer screening. So we know there's been a lot of disruption of care. I don't think we yet know the impact of that disruption. I don't, it's a little hard to measure, but I'm sure there will be impact, you know, from that disruption. And then I guess the last thing I would say, um, we don't really know how effective vaccination is in COVID in cancer patients because the vast majority of the clinical trials didn't include cancer patients, unfortunately. So we assume it's effective. There are some you know, newer studies ongoing now, but the, the first studies that led to approval uh, included only a, a very small fraction of cancer patients. Um, but of course I tell all my patients to get vaccinated. You know, there's, there's absolutely no reason not to. I've had that, had that conversation multiple times today. Um, I think those are the highlights. If there's more, a more specific question, I'm happy to answer, but it is a pretty big topic. I think one of the questions here, someone says that the cancer show up, the kidney cancer show up in routine, uh, Blood work? No, is the short answer. So there's, mm -hmm. there aren't many cancers that show up in routine blood work. So prostate cancer can with a PSA, um, testicular cancer in young men has tumor markers in the blood. I'm sure there's other examples I'm, I'm not thinking about, liver cancer sometimes, et cetera, but there's no blood test in the world that's available right now, that's FDA approved and licensed that can detect kidney cancer. So we draw a lot of blood on patients, but we're mostly monitoring their organ function as it's affected by treatment. We're not looking to detect cancer. Thank you for that. This, and I guess it's this question, and we hear a lot of, I guess people say home remedies is lemon water, cranberry juice, and how much water do you have to drink to protect your kidneys? <laughs> yeah, so this is a kidney function question, not really a kidney cancer question, right. but I always tell my patients you know, they'd need to drink enough fluids to make clear urine, right? If you're making clear urine, it means your body's getting rid of water. So it has enough, it's getting rid of the excess. 
So I think that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Most of my patients have one kidney because they had it cut out for cancer two months ago or 10 years ago. And for some reason, they get in their heads that they have to sort of flood themselves. So they're drinking gallons of water a day. They're up all night urinating, <laughs> but that's really not the case. I mean, you know, I think if you're making clear urine, you're drinking enough water is a good rule of thumb. Um, in terms of the other other things to quote unquote protect your kidneys, again, it's probably a question more for a nephrologist than an oncologist, but I'm not aware of certain things, honestly, that protect your kidneys. You protect them by keeping your blood pressure under control, keeping your blood sugar under control, um, yeah, being well hydrated, you, you know, not taking medicines that hurt your kidneys. So the, that's how you protect them more than a certain, you know, lemon water or something. Okay, thank you for that. And we had another question. Uh, so what, what's some signs to look for? Is there a sign you can look for kidney problems or kidney cancer? Your kidney is not functioning normally. Um, you know, unfortunately, most people are asymptomatic. So again, a common story would be somebody goes into the emergency room because they got into a car accident or they have some totally unrelated symptom. But anytime you go into the emergency room, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get a CT scan. <laughs> if you have any sort of suggestive symptom, you're getting a scan. It's so easy these days. So, you know, a lot of my patients have that story where they didn't really have symptoms from their disease. They just had other symptoms or showed up in an ER and they ended up getting a scan and they found their cancer. That's not uncommon. Um, as I alluded to, if patients do have symptoms, it might be something like blood in the urine would probably be the most common one. And it might be what we call gross hematuria, like, like it looks like bright red blood that comes out, or it might be more subtle. It might be um, just where the toilet water looks pink or that it's a very brief episode or that it's microscopic so even the patient wouldn't notice. Um, but if you have blood in the urine, it's not just from kidney cancer. There's a whole lot of things that can cause it, mostly like kidney stones and other benign things, but it's never normal. It is never normal to have blood in your urine. And unfortunately, we see people delay going to the doc because they have an episode, it gets better. They kind of forget about it and they're busy and they move on. But it's just, it's never normal. It always needs to be investigated. Thank you. I have another question. It says, can altoplasty, I should hope I said you right, be used in treating cancer? Can, let me see, I'm trying to find the question. Then someone else asked if kidney cancer shows up in both kidneys. Um, it's pretty uncommon to have, have both kidneys affected, to have what we call bilateral kidney cancer. If um, some of those inherited, like if young patients who have inherited syndromes, inherited cancer will often have it, but normal kidney cancer, it's, it's pretty uncommon. Um, oh, I see the question above it. I think they mean, I assume it's autophag autophagy. Okay. Autophagy is a, um, I don't, boy, I don't know how to explain it. Um, autophagy is, it's like cells eating other cells, you know? Um, so I guess the short answer is no, that it's not, a, it's not a way that we think, it's not a way that we treat kidney cancer. I don't know that it's really a way that any cancer is treated. It's, it's one of those concepts as opposed to a drug we give patient, autophagy is a concept of how we might get cancer cells to die, I guess might be the best way to put it. Okay. I think you went over this. Someone wanted to know what are the stages for kidney cancer. I think you showed that chart of the different yeah, stages. Yeah, every, every cancer has generally four stages, right? One is better, four is worse. Four is, any stage four cancer is cancer that's spread outside of the organ where it started. So if you have stage four lung cancer, it started in the lung and then it spread to, you know, another organ. And so that's, that's, and then stage one to three is usually confined to the organ, but bigger and bigger sizes, you know, within that organ as a very, as a very broad rule. Okay. I think I kind of touched on all the questions. Uh... Uh, I see another good question about if, the kidney are able to regenerate themselves? Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that. I guess I would say you can live for a hundred years with one kidney. So if I, you know, that's why people can donate their kidneys, right? For, you know, for transplant for somebody, you know, the good Lord made us with paired organs, right? Lungs are a paired organ. Kidneys are a paired organ. You got two of them. So you can eat, you know, many of my patients have part or all of one kidney taken out and they're, 
that's not the problem. They can live completely normal lives with one kidney. So it doesn't regenerate, but the other kidney kind of takes over. You have a lot of reserve. It would be the other way to say it. Thank you. I think that is a good, something good for people to know, because I think that hesitates a lot of people doing donations of kidneys and stuff, because they think the other one won't function very long. Yeah, I mean, it depends. You know, most donors are going to be sort of young, healthy people who mm -hmm. don't have other medical problems. So, you know, certainly if you had other medical problems, it's a different story. But yeah, most people, it's generally not an issue. Uh, somebody um, asked about hereditary. Is so, kidney so yeah, I had one slide on that. Hereditary, most Kidney cancer is not hereditary. It's just, I tell people, it's just bad luck. They didn't get it from their mother or father. They don't have any sort of inherited syndrome. It's just bad luck. And if I knew why they had it, I'd be a whole lot smarter than I am. So most of the cause of it is, is, uh, is unknown. Okay. And I think someone wanted to know, I think you spoke on this. I think men are more prone men to Men are that. more common. Yeah, about two to three times as common. It's not really clear why that's the case. Um, I see a question about drinking alcohol. Drinking alcohol does not cause kidney cancer, thankfully. <laughs> kidney cancer is curable if it's stage four. Yeah, about that, that number of about 20 or 30%. So if, if kidney cancer is confined to the kidney, it's very curable. If you have a three centimeter kidney mass, it's 95% curable. That's all it is. Um, as it gets bigger, it gets less curable. And as it spreads, it's less curable. Stage four meaning it's spread. But even if you walk in the door and it's spread to your lungs, still about 20 to 30% of those patients will be cured. That's good. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I have one more question, Dr. Reedy. Um, several uh, people think that um, chronic diseases can deteriorate the function of the kidney. And is there any percentage of those ending in kidney cancer? No, it's not. So they're really two different things. So yes. kidney disease is very common, right? Unfortunately, because at least in this country, high cholesterol and high blood pressure and, and diabetes mm -hmm. are very common. And those are what damage your kidney, not in a day or a week, but over many years for various reasons. Mm -hmm. That doesn't cause kidney cancer at all. Those are two totally separate things. Um, but if you have what we call medical renal disease, meaning diabetes, high blood pressure, and your kidneys don't function because of those other diseases. It obviously complicates our ability to give treatment. It com might complicate if you need a surgery. So they're related in some way, but one doesn't cause the other, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I have another question. Uh, we know it's more prevalent in men than women, but what about in the African-American community as opposed to other it, it's actually less common in African Americans, so it tends to occur mm -hmm. in like more white Scandinavian populations. Mm -hmm. So in North, you know, Western Europe, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, it's much more common. Um, there is a, there are, I didn't really go into this. There are different types of kidney cancer, and there's a certain more, there, there are two more rare subtypes that occur more often in African Americans. One is called papillary kidney cancer. The name doesn't mean anything, but it's about 10% of kidney cancer. And for whatever reason, again, I'm not sure that we know, it tends to be younger African-American patients who get that. And then the other one, which is exceedingly rare, I've probably seen it three to four times in 20 years, is called medullary kidney cancer. And it only occurs in patients who have sickle cell trait. Not sickle cell disease, but only sickle cell trait. And so again, it's an awful, terribly aggressive cancer um, and it, again, it's, it's super, I've seen as much kidney cancer as anybody on the planet. I've seen it three or four times, you know, over two decades. So that exclusively occurs, you know, in African-Americans or I guess anybody who can get sickle trait. Okay. I think we have one other question, but I think you've already asked it. Do, um, so let's see. Kidney de develop in one kidney and not the other. Yep, definitely. And it usually okay. develops in one kidney. Do kidney beans help your kidney? I love that question. No, not that I'm aware of. I think they're just shaped like kidneys. <laughs> uh, what about children? So children don't, children get other tumors. Nothing that I've talked about today. They get something called Wilms tumor. Uh, I, I assume Wilm was like a pathologist or something who described it, but it's a totally different disease. They get chemotherapy. I don't see them. The pediatric oncologist see them. So, uh, you know, I've maybe seen one or two patients who happen to be in their 20s in my life, you know, but um, so children do get kidney cancer, but a totally different type than I've talked about today. 
Did we cover all the uh, all the questions in the see. chat? Let me Did scroll see here. Else? Stroke. Uh, men or women, heredity. Very good question. Yeah. Somebody asked, do STDs affect your kidneys? No, not that I'm aware of. Stages, both. Uh, yeah, there's no real... Somebody asked about good foods to eat for prevention. There's no foods that I'm aware of that prevent kidney cancer. I, I wish we knew, but mostly I tell people when they ask these kind of sort of nutrition questions, it's more just, I say, use common sense. Don't spend your life savings on miracle cures and diets and thing, and supplements because I'm not sure they help. And there's plenty of people who will take your money. Um, and I think common sense goes a long way. You know, I think that's true for a lot of things, but it's true here as well. No, thank um, you. Side effects? Yeah, I didn't really talk about side effects. Good question. Um, so again, this isn't chemotherapy. So the therapy we, that I described briefly, patients don't lose their hair. There's no nausea, vomiting. It's not like those chemo type side effects. There can definitely be side effects. So from immune therapy, the way I explain it to patients is that immune therapy is meant to stimulate inf inflammation, right? That's what its job is, is stimulating inflammation against tumor cells, but it can also stimulate inflammation against your normal organs like your skin causing a rash, your bowel causing diarrhea and so forth. So immune therapy generally is well tolerated, but it can have some sort of rare but serious, what we'd call inflammatory side effects. And then the blood vessel therapy I mentioned causes things like high blood pressure, fatigue, diarrhea. So kind of more nagging things, generally not like end up in the hospital type side effects, but kind of more nagging day-to-day -day things. Not that that's not important, but it's a little less in severity than like say chemotherapy can be. So definitely there are side effects, but I would say in broad terms for the drugs I give people, they're um, sort of in the middle to on the easier side in the world of cancer therapy. Yeah. So um, what is the survival rate for kidney cancer? Is, I heard that you talk about cure. So if, if, if somebody walks in the door with disease that's spread, so like that patient I presented, they have kidney cancer, it's spread to their lungs. I will usually quote those patients, the numbers that I've mentioned that I think there's about a 20 to 30% chance that we can cure you. And that the average survival, the median survival, as we say, is probably about five years. Okay. Now median just means half better, half worse, right? So for mm -hmm. that patient, the patient may live a lot shorter or a lot longer, right? So it's just, get, but it gives people some sense of what the disease is. Although, as I mentioned, it's very, uh, it's a very broad range. You know, it's, patients obviously have very different outcomes, but those are usually the numbers that I share with patients. Again, if you have, it confined to the kidney, it's a totally different conversation, right? I mostly see patients with advanced disease, but if you have a three centimeter tumor in your kidney, you're going to be cured of that 95% of the time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. Oh boy. Questions are coming fast and furious. <laughs> Is protein in the urine associated with kidney cancer? Uh, no, I, I mean, it's a tough question, but I would say generally if, you know, if I go to my primary care doc and I have protein in my urine, it's not from kidney cancer. It's from some other primary kidney disease. Like um, there are a bunch of kidney diseases that I'm not an expert in, but you know, if you had diabetes and high blood pressure, you can get protein in your urine, having nothing to do with having cancer in the kidney. Um, someone with one kidney, are they on dialysis? Not necessarily. I mean, I have plenty of patients who have part of one kidney, have a half of one kidney who are not on dialysis. So oh, okay. you, if you have otherwise healthy kidneys, um, you can live on just part of the organ. You'd be surprised, you know. Same with a lot of organs in your body. You don't need the whole thing. Like the, the good Lord made us with excess organs. Like we have excess kidney material, excess liver, excess pancreas. Like you can, you can get surgery to cut out various body parts and still function just fine. It's a redundant system. You know, it's a, it's a well-designed system. It's fairly redundant. Okay. I guess, I guess we can take this and let it be our last question. If somebody says, what's your best advice? I guess your best <laughs> advice for... <laughs> For Can what? You... For life? Oh, <laughs> my best advice. Um, boy, that's a tough question. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, again, I'd reiterate having blood in your urine is not normal. Go see a doctor if you have it. Um, this is just general medical advice. You know, um, the more you take care of your chronic health problems, the healthier you're going to be, right? A lot of cancer risk is related to obesity or related to diabetes or related to other health problems. So 
you know, sometimes easier said than done, but a lot of cancer prevention is just good primary care, right? It's weight management and diabetes management and blood pressure management, all those, you know, cluster, all those things that we, we all deal with as we get older. Um, and, you know, God forbid you get kidney cancer, then come see me and my colleagues will take care of you. <laughs> but I, I hope I usually tell my patients, I, you know, I, I hope we never need to meet again, right? That's, you never want to see me in the office. That's never a good thing. That's wonderful, Dr. Rini. And, and, <laughs> yes. and before you leave, I would like to uh, recommend people to have the regular cancer screenings. I, I, I know through the pandemic, this has been decreasing a lot. So if you can share with us a little bit. Yes, absolutely. You know, cancer screening is important, right? There's, there's a reason and, and we're really lagging. And so get your vaccination, get in and get screened for whatever cancer is appropriate based on your age and gender and things like that. I mean, I do it, right? So abs absolutely, there's no, no, reason, no reason not to do it. 